Hi, readers. Welcome to Catholic Reads podcast. I'm ARK Watson, and today I'm joined by Anne Margaret Lewis. Uh, Anne Margaret Lewis began her writing career um, writing tie in children's books and short stories for DC Comics. And then she published two editions of Star Wars, The New Essential Guide to Alien Species. And moving on from that, she started writing sci-fi, fantasy, historical fiction, and, and uh, what we're going to talk about today, Sherlock Holmes Mysteries. Um, her first original book, Murder in the Vatican, Church Mysteries of Sherlock Holmes, was the Independent uh, Book Publishers Award winner for 2010 and a finalist for the Catholic Arts and Letters Award. Um, she followed that with another Sherlock Holmes novel entitled The Watson Chronicles, a Sherlock Holmes novel and stories. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, I'm very excited to be talking with uh, Anne Margaret. She's got a really awesome, uh, interesting writing history, as you can tell. Um, but getting into your Sherlock Holmes book, uh, I've got a copy here. Yay! Um, <laughs> uh, what inspired you to write this book? Going from like DC to Star Wars, then to like, oh yeah, Sherlock. <laughs> well. Because I wrote um, for basically people, property owners, people who owned licensed properties and like DC mm -hmm. and, and Star Wars, they own those properties. Um, going, to, going to another kind of property was not necessarily a, a jump for me. Um, although I, I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. I always have been. And um, when I, and it all kind of, I, I, I kind of give you a little history here. It all kind of started because I, um, I was on a, a fan group list, Sherlock Holmes fan group list, and an argument was broke out about one of the worst stories in the Sherlock Holmes canon of stories called the Mazarin Stone. And this is one that Doyle decided to write it in third person rather than Watson's voice. And he also, basically it was, it was what he had done is he had written a play called The Crown Diamond, mm -hmm. and he adapted that into a short story. So it's got a lot of problems with it in terms of uh, writing in general, um, there's a, it's very dialogue heavy. Um, there's not the beautiful lush descriptions that you would have, like say in Hound of the Baskervilles. It lacks Watson's voice, and so there's a lot of problems with it. And the argument on the on this little fan group list was, you know, could that story have been written in Watson's voice? All right, would it have made the story better? And I argued, yeah. It could. It would be. It would be a better story if you. It would um, change the structure of the story. It, it would automatically engage the reader if you have it in Watson's voice. And so, um, oh, the argument was like, oh yeah, we'll prove it. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I actually took Doyle's story, and um, I edited. I played editor on Conan Doyle. I, I couldn't believe I was doing this. I went yeah. and I changed his text into first person in Watson's voice. And then I wrote sections to fill in where Watson, because Watson leaves at one point and comes mm -hmm. back. So I actually follow Watson where Watson went and comes and he comes back. And so it added mystery to the story to what Holmes was doing. And it made it a, an, a, more, a better story. Um, I didn't want to edit it too much. There are sections I would have cut out completely if I were you know, really editing, home, editing Doyle. But um, I think in the end, it turned out to be a better story. So that little exercise there made made me want to. I said, "This is fun, <laughs> you know, to write." And and then in the midst of doing that, because I had to research where Watson was at that time, what was going on, I had to reread the canon to do this. Mm -hmm. The whole set of stories, I had to read the whole thing to find out, you know, where we were in time, what was going on in Watson's life. And then I read another one of Watson's stories, one of the stories, there's three stories in the canon of Sherlock Holmes stories where uh, we aren't, it's not written in Watson's voice. There's three of them. One mm -hmm. is called The Blanchard Soldier. And in that one, Holmes writes his own story. And and he talks about how, and he's really annoyed at the beginning of the story. Well, Watson left me for a wife, the only selfish thing he's ever done. And I, and I was like, well, that's really interesting. So there's a bit of the snarkiness in Holmes' thing. So that got me thinking about the stories I could tell. Um, the root of that became the Watson Chronicles, not not um, the other one. But I said, well, I wonder how many other nuggets there are like this for stories. And then I discovered what they call the, the whole, there's actually a name for this in the Sherlock Holmes fandom, which I didn't know until this point, called the um, 
the untold tales. And what these are, are basically what, like that, little nuggets that Watson drops out of stories that he tells you about, he kind of tells you the title or the context of the, or the you know nugget of that case, but he doesn't tell you the story. Mm -hmm. So, and there's several of these, many of them, um, uh, uh, the hundreds, uh, where Watson says, well, you know, the uh, guy who left his umbrella, you know, or, or the mysterious worm unknown to science and things like that. Those things are kind of like dropped into the stories and Watson never tells them to you. And there were three of them that were about the church. And uh, one of them was mentioned in Hound of the Baskervilles. That was the Vatican cameos, where Holmes goes, I was tied up on this affair of the Vatican cameos, and so I missed all the latest news. I was like, Vatican cameos? Because he was working for the Pope. And it actually mentions that he was working for the Pope. And there was a second one, it was in a uh, later story called Black Peter, where he says, um, his, what was that one? Oh, the, the sudden death of Cardinal Tusca, which he was also doing for the Pope. So it means that Holmes solved two cases for the Pope. And I'm like, well, this would be fun to write, you know? So then I got, so I went and I said, well, what kind of, what would happen in the sudden death of Cardinal Tosca? What would happen with this mysterious Vatican cameos affair? And so I wrote those two stories for the, the tales that Watson mentioned, but never wrote. Um, so that's what they are. They're untold, what they call untold tales, untold cases. Mm -hmm. And I then the third one was the, the, the two Coptic patriarchs, which is uh, mentioned also in, later in the canon. And uh, that was not necessarily so much about the Pope, but it's about you know the Coptic church. And so I tied them all together and it became a little bundle of, they're kind of, well, I think Vatican cameos, which is the middle story in it, is really a, um, a novella within there. So you have two short stories in a novella that's part of the, the that book. Mm -hmm. Now you've yeah, read it, right? No, the, yes, okay, yes, I so, have. And, so. and I read um, the Watson Chronicles as well. That was also okay. really um, So, uh, um, <clears throat> what, uh, how did you manage to get into writing Doyle's style? Uh, cause that, that's something that is, that did really impress me was like how much this really did feel like an original, um, Conan Doyle story. Well, the trick for that is, um, and I actually, I, I was telling you that I had done a talk to a Sherlock Holmes group in Chicago. And um, I was kind of asked this, and it's the only thing you can do is just read Doyle's home stories. You can't read anything else. I didn't read anybody, because there's a lot of people who are imitating Doyle. I didn't read the imitations. I only read him. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, had at my disposal, and I think it's still online. I haven't looked for it recently. But someone had the canon up on the, on the in a searchable form that you could look for phrases and words and, and I could see if Doyle ever used a word. You know, if hmm. I was, you know, worried about, I might, I'm going to use this word. Is this something he would look at? But uh, a lot of it was, I had to go back to my English degree and literally deconstruct Doyle's writing style and understand, well, how did he make sentences? What kind of verbs did he use? Um, how was he structuring his, um, his, how did he do his dialogue? Um, you know, how it, it, everything that he did as a writer, I had to really look at it and break it apart and study that. And, uh, and it, was, it was hard work to do that. It's hard to imitate his voice. But, then, but it made me, ultimately, it made me a better writer to do that because I looked at someone who's really a good writer and said, well, what is he doing here? Oh, okay. I can do this. You know? Um, so it, it was uh, a lot of it was just basically imitating his, analyzing his style, reading just that. That's all I could read. And, um, and I read it like several times before I started and I read it while I was doing it. That's all I read. I said, if I'm having a hard time catching this voice, I got to go back and read another Watson story. <laughs> And so that's what I did. And, and that was, that was pretty much it. Just imitating him. Um, I ha would have a harder time. Actually, I had an idea. I have an idea for a story to imitate Mark Twain in Huckleberry Finn, but I haven't been able to capture that voice yet. So I would love to do a sequel to Huckleberry Finn and uh, imitate Twain. 
So that's my next, oh. one of my goals in the future is to do that because I think it would be fun. But boy, he's hard because <laughs> it's got that, oh, that dialect that he's got, you know, that he yeah. has captured. Mm-hmm. So I'd be imitating his, his him imitating a di- that dialect. Oh tough. my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's still for me, and I and I live in the area that he imitates. So. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's a dialect from a couple generations ago. So. Oh yeah, it's different now. It's different now than what it was. And uh, when I teach Huckleberry Finn, I have to play it on recording because sometimes the kids can't read it. Yeah, because of the way the dialogue is recorded. You know, uh, they they say like, they understand it if they hear it, but they don't understand it if they're reading it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was strange that way. So it's like, how would I imitate him? Mm. But yeah, I'd love to do a sequel to Huckleberry Finn as I want him to come back. As, I want him to, we, I want to see him as an adult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think and of course he'd be an adult. I wanted him to, to be during the civil war. Oh goodness. And he encounters Tom Sawyer during the civil war. Mm. Mm. <laughs> would that be great? That sounds really <laughs> dark. Too, oh yeah. What? <laughs> It'd be dark. It sounds really dark. And his stories were so funny. So that, that'd yeah. be difficult. But, you know, if you can hit upon it, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah. We'll see if I could do it. I could always explain how, how the writing is different. I could always explain that Huck actually did get more of an education, even though he was rebelling against it, so mm-hmm. that his writing, his ability to write, improved. Yeah. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, I, can, I, can and everything. that. I can see that for the character too. Yeah. So, like, I'm not gonna, but this is interesting. <laughs> but it's stupid. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll take a stab at it. It's like, you know, you might remember me from, you know, except how that's how Huck Finn starts. Like, you might recall me from the story of Tom Sawyer. It was mm-hmm. kind of a stretch, you know, <laughs> but you know, that's that's how he starts off Hawk's Finn. So I can always start it like that. You might remember me from back then. I write a little better now. I thought I'd never do this again, but here it is. <laughs> so cool. yeah. anyway, so anyway, so that's all you can really do is just really rip apart an author's writing style. It, yeah. it, I mean, it, to, into pieces. What kind of verbs are they using? What kind of sentence structure does he use? When does he use that sentence structure? And one time does he use another sentence structure? I mean, it really got that to the nitty gritty there. What What did you learn about Doyle's style doing that that you hadn't really noticed before? One thing I learned is, well, first of all, he was a master of the language. He really was. He had a, a vocabulary. I sat there and go, uh, do I know this word? <laughs> And I have to, you know, look up some, you know, words that he chose. And, you know, when I first read them, I didn't really, uh, you know, do that. I mean, so I, this time I actually had to look some things up. It's like, do I know this word? Um, so he really had, he knew um, a lot of verbs. He was, had very good use of verbs. He didn't have, uh, he had, he used adverbs every once in a while, but she, I don't think he ever used the word very. <laughs> Unless it was in dialogue. I mean, he had he didn't use adverbs as much as he just would pick a very strong verb. Okay, so that's something I learned from him. Um, his dialogue was really well done. You never, I never lost place of who was talking because it said, uh, "Hey, sorry, say hello." <laughs> so his um sense of character, you know, in, in dialogue, he had had these long streams of dialogue and sometimes without the speech tags and you still knew who everybody was from what they were saying. Yeah. That's crazy to me. I, I need to work on that. So, and, uh, and, and that was pretty amazing that he could do that. He could do these long streams of dialogues and, and not lose the reader. Um, what else did I think was kind of cool? Um, his, his descriptions, you mm-hmm. know, he had this really good sense of being poetic in such a way and really creating an image in your head. And my descriptions are the one thing I think I, I could learn a bit more about. And I certainly learned a lot from him. Just to give an example, one of his stories said, uh, the, the wind sobbed like a child in the chimney. Can you, and, and if you know Victorian literature at all, they would send children up the chimney to clean the clean the chimneys out, right? 
And so if the wind outside is howling, it's sobbing like a child in a chimney. It's like, that's very poetic. It's like you said to go, wow. ooh, it's, it's a way to set setting. And he could do that. Now I'm dinging. I got to turn off the sound on my phone here. <laughs> um, he really could um, evoke a mood is what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. I, I learned that from him um, that you really need to evoke mood. And he could do that in a first draft. I can't do that in a first draft. I kind of just like blot the story out and then I go back and add that stuff. So, so it was pretty impressive. His first drafts apparently were really clean. Although he could have used an editor on some of them. <laughs> There's someone like, hmm, you need an editor. <laughs> Why did you do that? And it's not because he misspelled anything or typed anything wrong or anything else like that, but he really needed someone to hold his feet to the fire and make sure he did his best work all the time. Because there are some of those home stories you just go, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh why did you um, actually in your first in your first story? I really the the uh, death of Cardinal Tosca. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked how you and throughout this, the whole stories, I liked how you were very respectful of Holmes and Watson's Anglican faith and roots. Um, but uh, how did you balance that with kind of dispelling a lot of Anglican and especially in that day misconceptions about Catholicism and the Vatican and Catholic culture and the Pope and all that. Um, how did I, how did I balance that with, okay, well, it's, yeah. I, I kind of relied a lot on history. Mm -hmm. um, Holmes and Watson, I always viewed them not so much as church going guys. They are, they were probably raised Anglican. I kind of guess Watson might have been more raised in the Church of Scotland, uh, mm -hmm. or this, you know, rather than the Church of England. Uh, but they were both pretty much English guys, and um, that were, and that and that society was becoming more secular at, even then. All mm -hmm. right. So I saw them as unchurched Anglicans, and and they are products of an Anglicanism that is, that is in, that has a hard time with the Catholic church. I mean, it just does. And it's just, that's just the nature of, of England at the time. And so I really, if they're guys from their time, they really weren't against Holmes himself. If you read the stories, he actually could interact with anybody. He really could. Um, he had less respect for <laughs> like royals and or not so much royals, but he because he liked the queen, but he didn't like um, nobility so much because he could get a little bit snooty. So he he um, didn't like the classist attitude. So he probably would be a bit more respectful of Catholics in general. Um, but the Pope, the Pope was considered a, a sense of royalty and he had a hard time with that. And he really, you know, so that's kind of why he graded him a little bit. I think when you first see him, um, actually if you, in, in the, I think it was in Vatican cameos when that you see, have them first meet each other mm -hmm. in that one. Cause you have in, in this, the way I put the stories, Cardinal Tusca, he's already knows the Pope and he already likes the Pope, but, yeah. but the Pope has already won him over, showing that he was a very humble man, and he was. He was very intellectual, very smart, very much from a noble family. Um, however, he had a, a very uh, Christ-like sense to him, and most people said that about Leo XIII. He could be very, he could deal with, he could deal with anybody. You know, he's one of those guys who um, saw the human dignity in every person, and Holmes knew that by that point. So when you see him in the first story, they already have a friendship, right? The, the second story is where you see where they kind of were button heads a little bit. And it's because Holmes perceived him to be part of this noble class that he didn't like. Mm -hmm. All right. And that's kind of keeping with that, his character. So if I'd stayed true to the character and I kept him grounded in history, it seemed to work. It balanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Focus. Don't let the political issues get away. Get in, yeah, in. no, I just kept him where he was. I made him a man of his time, you know, man yeah. of his time with who was a bit more understanding of 
people who were different than himself or, or, or who would be convinced. And I think what really convinced him in that story was the fact that the homes, that the Pope was kind of a smart guy and kind of an intellectual in his own right. And, mm -hmm. and humble enough to see that Holmes had a gift he did not. Mm -hmm. So once, you know, once you acknowledge, Holmes has got an ego. So once you acknowledge it, oh, you're smarter than me, he'll go, oh, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> So. Yeah, I, uh, I had, um, at one of my jobs, I had someone prep me when I was going into a new location. They're like, hey, this person is very prideful, but that just means they're really easy to go along with. So, Because all you have to do is your first day, ask them for advice. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. Yep. And, yep. Um, yeah, and it works. Um, that's That's really interesting. And that's really wise, too. I think um, sometimes people can get bogged down and depressed about, oh, how prejudiced the past was and kind of lose sight of like, there were people there and they may have been misinformed about certain things, but you know, if you're a good person, you're open-minded and you're willing to listen, um, you're not necessarily a jerk just because <laughs> you were miseducated. Now, um, in, in Vatican cameos, which is where we had this thing, um, Holmes was only, he was sent there by the, by the queen, remember? Mm -hmm. so, so, so he was kind of like seeing it, okay, I'll do this as a favor for the queen, but I'm not entirely certain I'm happy about this. Cause he knew, uh, he knew that Pope Leo's background is that as of a nobleman. So obviously he's going to be like every other nobleman I've ever dealt with, you know, uh, <laughs> no, apparently he's really not. And that's kind of what, that's the kind of the point of their becoming friends. It's definitely, it's better nobleman, <laughs> noble nobleman. <laughs> what made you decide to write that um, that second story in Pope Leo's voice as opposed to John Watson's? Especially after like doing all this research into John Watson's voice. <laughs> I, I don't know. It just sort of kept. Sorry, my email just. I forgot my email's open. Um. It's going bing, bing, bing in the background. I'm like, oh, gosh, shut my email. Um, <laughs> what made me, I think it was, uh, what happened was I, I wanted to know where Pope Leo was in that time period, what he was doing and what he was been. So I wanted to read, I wanted to read, I wanted to read his writing to kind of get a sense of him. So I started reading his papal encyclicals and translated into English. There's a beautiful voice to him. I said, I like, I like this guy, you know, I like the way he writes. Cause I mean, I read some of the other people in cyclicals. I read Benedict the 16th, who's very straightforward, very clear, still educate, you know, a very, he's erudite is the word I like to say. Um, Pope Leo was like that, you know, but also he had this fatherly sense to him where it's like, he was reaching out and giving everybody a big hug and saying, now this is the way it's gotta be. <laughs> <laughs> you know um but but his voice was 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 beautiful it had you know it was obviously uh someone who is highly educated had a sense of paternal nobility about him who had a sense of kingliness to him and uh, i liked him i just liked him i just liked the way he sounded and i said i want to write him and i wonder if this story would be better if uh i let him tell it because he's solving it. So um, it just seemed to come naturally that it would be him telling the story rather than Watson. Um, and so I was like, I had to get a way to get Watson out of there as much as I'd like it. And as much as I love stories that are told in Watson's voice, obviously, because I write an entire book in Watson's voice. Um, but uh, it just it seemed natural for me to do the first meeting alone with the two of them mm -hmm. and give something different. Cool. I just loved his voice. His voice was so sweet. And Annie made me nervous because I felt like he was watching me do this. And I'm like, oh, please don't, please. You know, I was like, Holy Father, I'm going to write the story. I hope you know that I'm, <laughs> this is a compliment. <laughs> I know this didn't really happen. You know, this is for fun. <laughs> so, I almost nice. felt like I had to put a veil on while I was writing. It was really funny. <laughs> Cool. And I um, love his voice. I would love to go back to his voice someday. I think it was, it was, uh, 
<sighs> I actually would love to tell a bunch of mystery stories from his point of view, make him a, a you know, detective in his own right. After meeting he, Holmes, he decides to solve some mysteries in the Vatican. <laughs> of course, the hard part with that is that he never left the Vatican. You know, he was a prisoner of the Vatican, just like Pius IX was. You know about that time of history, right? Uh, not super well. Uh, okay. Can you elaborate? All right. Well, what happened was the Kingdom of Italy was founded in, I think, in the 1870s. And at that time, they took over the Papal States and it just kind of took it over. We're not even asking. We're just taking it. Yeah. And and in a sense of protest, Pius the Knight said, then I am never leaving. I'm not going to leave the Vatican, which means that he's not going to travel around Italy. He's not going. And he didn't also give the Ubi et Orbi blessing, which is given, I think, at Christmas time. I think he gives mm -hmm. the blessing of the whole world. He would not do that. Yeah, as a, as a protest. And Pi Pope Leo, who followed Pius the Ninth, Stuck, stuck with what he established. And he did not leave the Vatican, which means that he didn't go around. And as the bishop of the church, you would see him leave. He would go to churches in, in the area. He'd go around Italy. He didn't really travel too much out of Italy unless he was forcibly done. You know, the Pope didn't leave really Italy all that much um, unless they kind of like drag him, drug him, kicking and screaming like, you know, um, uh, Napoleon did. But... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for the most part, they just did not leave the, the Vatican at all after that. And he didn't give any blessings either out to the world. That was kind of serious. And that remained the, the way of, of doing things until, gosh, when did that end? I don't remember. I think it was uh, Benedict during World War I, I think. I'd have to double check. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of more important things to worry about during World War One. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of trouble can, that can get up to in a small town, especially. But he didn't leave the walls. Wow. And and uh, neither did. And, and that must be hard, you know, for someone who used to be pretty active and go around uh, Italy, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to just not leave the Vatican anymore is probably pretty tough on him. Yeah, no, I like the stories about uh, Pope John Paul sneaking away to go skiing <laughs> because it's just such a human thing. He's like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's so why I something like, like John Paul II traveling everywhere like he did, no pope had ever done that. Now, they, they did they did go around Italy, but they didn't really go. I mean, like they would never, in fact, the pope never, when I say he never left the Vatican, I mean, he literally never left the Vatican. He didn't even go to Castle Gandolfo. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was the period. That was the time. Yeah. So it'd be tough to, tough to write mysteries in that. So they have to all take place inside the Vatican. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Or maybe like someone gets murdered outside. And yeah. Takes and refuge. Maybe he has to. Like, well, you, you saw him dress up like a, a common priest to, you know, <laughs> at one point. So um, no spoilers for those people who haven't read it. <laughs> He did sneak out. So maybe we could have him sneak it out, but he's kind of old and frail. So he has to have someone be his legs to run out and go do things for him. Kind of yeah. like, kind of like a, um, his Archie Goodwin. Um, and if you've ever read, uh, oh God, what's the name of them? Oh, I can think of Archie's name, but I can't think. Nero Wolf. Nero Wolf. He had a, a guy who was his leg man who went out and did all of his research for him, brought all the stuff back to him, and he solved, you know, whatever the mystery was. It's a Nero Wolf. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> what mystery series is Nero Wolf from? Sorry, what? What mystery series is Nero Wolf from? Oh, it's 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 that's the name of the character. Nero Wolf is the detective. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And and it's his own series of, of detective novels. And Archie Goodwin is his uh, his leg man. He's Watson essentially. Um, and it takes place in New York. Art, uh, and Nero Wolf lives in New York on Thirty Third Street, I think. And and he doesn't leave. He cultivates um, flower um, orchids, I think. And and he is a uh, um, into uh, well made food. So he's just really, he kind of was almost like, if you know the character of Mycroft, he's a lot like Mycroft. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he's like a Mycroft character. And Archie is this tough, uh, almost like hard boiled detective guy, 
but he is he works for Nero Wolf and he goes out and finds all the information that Nero needs to solve this mystery and he brings mm -hmm. it back to them and they work together on it. Cool. Let's see. Um, so I know that um, aside from Pope Leo, um, you have Father Brown and Flambeau make appearances, mm -hmm. um, which was fantastic. Uh, all the fan squeals, yes. Um, <laughs> were there any other historical figures that you drew from in your stories? I'm trying to think here. In those particular stories... I didn't get a chance to Google it, but the lady that you have... Rosalinda Matteo, was she someone? No, I made her up. Okay. Ma Ma Matteo is, is okay. actually a family name in my in my family. Um, one of the nice. my cousins, his last name, second cousins in northern Italy, his last name is Matteo. So no, Rosalinda, I totally made up. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> um, anybody else I drew from historically? Well, I mentioned John Henry Newman, uh, that Pope Leo actually went to visit him, and he did. He went to the oratory in uh, England. We got, of course, Queen of England herself mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think of people that are actually kind of resemble anybody in the stories that are real historical figures. Uh, not that I could think of. Most of everybody else I totally made up, including the um Pope Leo's assistant I made him up because I think he was a different guy yeah the younger guy the young priest that goes and run around for him yeah mm -hmm. he didn't exist <laughs> I think he had it oh I think his actual secretary was like a bishop so yeah. makes sense um so you, you touch upon Pope Leo's vision um like I like how you you set that you set that up. Can you tell me kind of what inspired you to to do that to include that? I wanted to introduce the fact that he was a bit of a mystic, all right, and uh, and I wanted Holmes to experience that because he is not. Now, there's it's um, a, a big debate in Sherlock Holmes fandom as to whether Holmes was an atheist or not. I don't believe he was. There's evidence that he was not. Um, and, 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 but he didn't, I thought him more of an agnostic type. Um, mm -hmm. And someone who is very grounded in science though. Someone who's very grounded in science. And it is, of course, it's a myth that science and faith kind of don't work together because they do. Um, both are based in reason and you need reason to make a choice and a decision. And that reason focus, you know, in faith is just as important as it is in science. So um, I kind of wanted Holmes to be confronted with evidence that there might be something else and uh, to be a, more certain of it, you know, than he was and to come to some respect for the mystical life that, and, and I did wanted to do that through Pope Leo and him having um, a vision even while they're there. Now, of course, it's not, I didn't want to do it in dramatic fashion, you know. Well, I just saw, no. I wanted, I wanted Holmes to, I wanted Holmes to see him wonder at what he's, what's going on. Now, and, and of course, Leo doesn't explain anything. He doesn't say anything, right? But I wanted him to, to see that there could be something else. So uh, it was something is kind of to uh, get Holmes to grow a little bit. Because in the canon, Holmes doesn't really, there's not too many moments of where the character, you know, there's, a, you know, characters are either static or dynamic. And I, and Holmes is generally a static character throughout most of the canon. So I wanted to, my thing is when you write a story, you're, you have to have one, at least one dynamic character. And that's just the way I write. Okay, so that's where I kind of was pushing my will on Conan Doyle. It's like I wanted a dynamic character, and I want Holmes to grow a little bit. I don't necessarily want him to say, I totally am Catholic. No, I wasn't going to have him totally convert to Catholicism, because that would be totally, people are going to be rolling their eyes at that. Yeah. But I did want him to kind of come to some sort of understanding and respect for the mystical life, and that's that's where I think he went. Does that help? Well, I mean, I think that, the, no, yeah, and I liked the way you handle that, because... 
even though he's mostly a static character, he's not completely like, yeah. um, right. You know, his it's it kind of mirrors the degree of attitude change that he has towards women mm -hmm. um when he's um oh snap her name fell out of my head oh and scandal and bohemian um yeah irene adler irene yeah, adler yeah. yes it kind yes. of mirrors that degree of change of right like, huh you have misjudged yeah exactly uh, i may have misjudged and he has that those kinds of changes in the canon at certain, at, definitely at certain moments. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite stories is the yellow face. It's not everybody else's favorite, but I like this one because you have a, um, a an interracial couple. And she's hiding the fact that she had has a mixed race child, and and he's totally wrong. I mean, in this story, totally wrong. He makes a big mistake, and uh, and you see him going, well, you know what? I next time I do something like this, just make, just whisper the Norbury in my ear, which is where this takes place. Just whisper that in my ear, Watson, because then I'll, you know, yeah. I'll make sure not to make such snap judgments in the past. <laughs> it was totally not what he was expecting when the, in that story. And I love that. I love the fact that it was totally not what he was expecting and he learned something from it. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of, um, and, and they're not always earth shattering, but it's him going, yeah, that was dumb. <laughs> 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 I could have done better with that one. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, and uh, you also kind of touched upon uh, Freemasonry in um, Cardinal Tosca's uh, mm -hmm. uh, story. Um, I don't know of any Freemasonry attempts on um, church officials, but... Um, I was just interested why you brought that in. Well, mm -hmm. in in history, you know, it, it waxes and wanes. Mm -hmm. Freemasonry was like the core of revolutionary movement in France in a lot of portions of Europe. And um, in fact, with Pius IX, the Freemasons actually tried to dump his body into the Tiber. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, I mean, during his funeral procession, they, they really tried to, you know, his funeral procession was near the Tiber River and they, they tried to throw his coffin in. Seriously, the Pope. So they're, they, they um, wanted to, so it depends on where you are and at what time. Mm -hmm. um, but since it was, in fact, Freemasonry was the core of, how the papal states ended up being taken away from the Vatican. That oh, really? movement. So it's, it, historically, uh, and it's not so much, I mean, it was the core of our rebellion here in the United States too, you know, against the crown. Um, all of our guys, you know, our founding fathers were Freemasons. Many of them were. And yeah. so, but uh, Freemasonry here in this country is not as big of a, I wouldn't say a big of threat <laughs> as uh, it was in Europe, mm -hmm. because, but it was um, something that was a rallying point, I think, or a rallying uh, movement um, to make the common guys kind of rise up. Gotcha. And, and it's not so much here. And I would say most Freemasons I know are pretty nice guys. I don't agree with the philosophy of it and, and uh, Catholics should not be Freemasons because of the oaths they take. But, um, and so most of them are, I know are pretty good, decent guys. Um, but it, it, th that was the truth of it in Europe. It was, it was a core of the revolution, especially, especially the French revolution and of course ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Against the nobility. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, and strangely enough, there were a lot of noblemen who were also Freemasons. So it was like, <laughs> where does it end, you know? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was kind of like, it was a political, it became political. You were, it, it kind of like grew out of Freemasonry, a lot of the political um, rebellion in Europe at the time. Okay. That is really interesting. I had no idea. Um, it was certainly an eye opener for me because I was trying to look for a villain. I said, boy, yes. You know, when I started researching, you know, the popes of the period, I'm like, holy cow, they tried to throw his body in the Tiber? Oh, that was, <laughs> what the heck? So I kind of, what, in doing my research, I, I found things I could use, and that was one of the things I could use. 
-hmm. And one of the guys, I remember I signed a book to a guy who was big in the Freemasonry here in the United States. And, and uh, I signed it to him. He goes, just put, make sure you put that it's the European Masons <laughs> in my, in the, when you signed the book, I said, I said, okay, it was the European Masons. And then I signed it <laughs> and not the Americans. It's pretty funny. That's interesting. Have you gotten any um, kind of interesting responses like that from secular or non-Catholic readers? Um, most of the people who have read it, if who are not Catholic, still enjoyed it. Uh, I, I had most people give me positive feedback on it. Um, the only time I've ever had a negative response to it, mm, sorry, it's one guy who's an atheist and he's in in the I guess in, in Illinois somewhere. And he uh, mm -hmm. was like, oh gosh, it's, it's got the Pope in it. It was pretty much just, re, you know, re responding negatively because it had the Pope in it. Okay. Didn't want any Catholic <laughs> faith at all in anything. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I <laughs> if that... I'm writing church mysteries and I'm dealing with the Pope, you know, yeah. he's in there. And I, he didn't like the fact that I made him positive. I showed him positively. Sorry. Mm -hmm. He was a nice guy. <laughs> You're gonna have to deal with that. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, most, um, most, most of the feedback I've gotten was positive. That's good. Well, aside from um, writing, what do you do? Um, is is writing your full time job, or do you do something else on, on the side? Um, I am a part time English teacher. Uh, so I teach writing and I teach um, American Lit and um, also uh, freshman literature, which is looking at all the elements of fiction and teaching them about how to how to read fiction for all the like the theme and the characters and that sort of stuff. So um, it's high school. Mm -hmm. um, so that's primarily, I guess you could say my my where I earn money. <laughs> Um, but I only do that part time because I um, I wanted to be available to my son. So um, we're going to be probably going full time soon. I have to work. You know, my son's now in high school. Um, other things I do is I, I direct plays and uh, in community theater, work with youth theater, and um, I'm a classical singer. So those are things okay. I do. I also get paid to sing, so that's nice. I'm not always. That's awesome. Where at? Oh, where at? Oh, um, I sing. Well, primarily now I sing at the cathedral here in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. um, I'm cantor there, and I also um, help out with the choir. Um, but I cantor elsewhere, and uh, um, I sing concerts too. Not often, not very often. Every once in a while, um, but that's pretty much pretty much it. I, I started singing too late. I I, I have sung in the um, the chorus of the Indianapolis Opera, but that was. Um, I haven't done that in a while, but it was fun. You know, I don't mind being in the chorus. I wouldn't want to be one of the soloists for that because that's a lot of work. And I, and I like to write more than I like to sing. I mean, I like them both about the same, but I like writing more than I like singing in terms of, I would rather be behind my computer <laughs> <laughs> typing away. So, so um, what would you do if you could write full time and that be your sole income? Oh my gosh. Um, I would certainly produce a lot more work. That's for sure. <laughs> I'd get it a lot more done. Um, I'd be very happy doing that. Um, I would write certainly more novels. Um, I would, I'm working on the space opera trilogy. That's, you know, science fiction fantasy. So that's fun. Um, I would finish that. I'd f get my, start doing my Popolio mystery stories going, which I'd love to do. Um, and uh, and just, it would be, I would love that. That would be maybe when I retire. <laughs> <laughs> but it, um, my problem is I like to volunteer for things all the time. So it ends up taking up, eating up some of my time. So the theater thing, I think I'd have to kind of tone down. Theater takes a lot of time. It's a really time sucker. As much as I love it, it's, uh, it, it affects you. <laughs> I don't get as much writing yeah. done when I'm directing a show. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I um, there, I didn't have any other questions. Um, but what you said? Uh, what are you working on now? You said you're working on space opera. Space opera, yeah. Space opera. I was explain what that is. Is it is science fiction, 
combined with fantasy, it's kind of like you have that, it's kind of Star Wars is space opera. It's usually an ongoing series um, and you can have mystical elements in it. And, um, but it's usually something that has the mystical elements in it that has spaceships. That's about as that's about the closest definition I've ever heard, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and that's fun. It's called Warrior of the Kazan. I have that coming out June twenty sixth. Uh, mm -hmm. That's for the first one in that series, and mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, what about what's the premise? Oh goodness, we have a a guy who is um, he is the I, I let me put this like it's kind of like Star Wars meets a princess of Mars. If you know John Carter of Mars, it's a lot like John Carter of Mars. Although people don't like me saying that because John Carter of Mars, the movie didn't do very well. However, if you watch the film, it wasn't that bad. Um, <laughs> it's kind of, um, so you have the main character is, uh, it's they, they are, I kind of deal with the Nephilim a little bit who are from the Bible who are people who have been cursed. And so they have tele telepathic powers and they've been put on another world. So they are actually human, but they're humans with telepathic powers. And uh, our main character is turning, what happens is if they do evil, they start to turn into demons. And that's what's happened to our main character. So he has to fight with that through the entire book and he has to save a princess. So he's got to save himself to save the princess. And it's, it's a fun story. That sounds awesome. That sounds really interesting. Well, as long as nobody's walking around butt naked like they do in John Carpenter. Uh, that, no, 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 no. That confused, that, that really, like, it's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even, like, described in a way that it was gratuitous. It's just like, oh, by the way, everyone in this scene is naked. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, well, Edgar Rice Burroughs could be a little bit funny yeah. that way <laughs> yeah he was a little <laughs> no mine's clean i have people who are clothed it's good they in fact, um they're uh they are very much uh my one of my friends jokingly called them my my uh nephilim people uh he called them space jews and i'm like what <laughs> 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 but uh, you can actually say that they kind of are space jews uh so they have uh, that that uh, biblical law and that they have to follow and and uh and he bought and uh my main character kind of messed that up <laughs> and so he starts turning into a demon ah! <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds really interesting I'm, I'm looking forward to to reading that when, when does that one come out june 26th of this oh, year exciting it's a couple exciting. more weeks all right it's on pre-order right now on amazon <laughs> okay all right we'll have to keep an eye out for that Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, joining me today. If uh, if you guys want to follow Anne Margaret Lewis, you can at annemargaretlewis.com. Um, also, definitely, if you keep an eye out on Catholic Reads, I'm sure you'll see more of her books on on our website. Uh, and if you don't have the, if you're like, oh, I don't have the money to you know support authors right now, that's okay. You can go to Catholic Reads and subscribe to our mailing list, and we send you a book once a week marked down 50% off to free so you can find whatever authors that you're interested in um, at a pretty cheap price and kind of really find something that speaks to you uh, and if you want to follow what I'm doing um, you, you can follow me at arkwatson.com all right well thank you so much uh, Anne and uh, hopefully I'll talk to you later uh, thanks for having me it was lovely talking to you bye, bye.